Hi, and welcome to Faith, Art, and Tiny Houses. I'm your host, Carmen Shank. Welcome back to the podcast. I'm here with Alex Eves today. He is a reuse expert, a filmmaker, and an apparel brand owner. Welcome, Alex. Hello. <laughs> so you're, you're in your uh, tiny house, which is a mm-hmm. truck. Tell me about your um, box truck. Uh, so it actually, I have this perfectly placed here. So this, it kind of <laughs> looks like this. And actually yeah. the ramp is out right now. So okay, um, it's a little bigger. This has like nine <laughs> it's a little bigger <laughs> yeah um so yeah it's a 17 foot um decommissioned u-haul truck that we converted oh, cool. into a 98 square foot tiny house oh that's great does it still say u-haul on the outside no when they decommission them they paint them all white and just oh, okay cover it up yeah i mean so you can see that it says it under okay you know, the stickers are still there but you know so it's kind of a stealth thing then. Yes, definitely. <laughs> okay. Uh, when you travel around, do people realize that it's a home? Um, not if they're looking from the front or the sides, really. I mean, one of the sides has a window cut out, but there's a lot of box trucks going around that have, you know, windows for whatever reason. Mm-hmm. Um, but the back, it's pretty obvious with a bright green door. <laughs> yep. And is this your full-time home? Uh, yeah. Uh, okay. And we're coming up on three years. So wow. I've been, you know, traveling about, I would say over the past three years, like half the year and then staying in the yard for the other half. Okay. So uh, you own an apparel brand. Where <laughs> do you do all of your um, apparel sorting and printing and storage and that kind of thing? Oh, I have thousands of t-shirts behind me. You just can't see. Are you kidding me? (laughs) Yes. Yes, I'm completely kidding. (laughs) Um, No, I do. um, So part of of why I do what I do is that I unfortunately slash fortunately grew up in a 17-room house. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Yes. And so one of the three basements uh, is (laughs) like... Three basements. Yes, yes, exactly. (laughs) Uh Uh-huh. Um, that's where I keep all of my shirts and I have my screen printer and back oh, cool. stock. And, yeah. Okay. Cause I, I, I literally have thousands of shirts because there's endless amounts of shirts that are going to get tossed or whatever. So yeah, crazy. Yeah. Um, but, but in the truck here, I do, I'm able to keep, you know, at least like 500 or so. Oh my goodness. Shirts. Really? Oh yeah. So yeah that's we, under the bed area. Yeah. There's a, um, can I bring this? Wait a minute. This is video. Ah, oh we're going to get a video tour. Sort of. So you see that, yeah. that bench couch area there. Right. So that flips open like a coffin. And then inside that is where I store a lot of shirts. Uh-huh. It flips yep. open like a coffin. <laughs> yep. I mean, and, and just in case anybody wanted to get any crazy ideas, we did cut some breathing holes in there. Oh, <laughs> so it's the it's like a, a Lincoln Continental trunk. You can fit one body or two, huh? Right. right. <laughs> well, tell me about what you're doing with your brand. You've got a couple thousand T-shirts. You're doing some screen printing. Tell me what your um, passion is with T-shirts. Uh, yeah, so my passion is reuse, um, and t-shirts is, is really where it all kicked off. Um, so my former life is I used to tour with bands selling merchandise. Um, I would tour around the world. It was like seven years that I did that, different oh, wow. rock and roll bands. Um, and there was just this one specific instance that changed everything. Basically, a t-shirt was printed incorrectly, and that's what I find out. That's what I found out for the first time what happens when that happens. And all 144 brand new shirts that just had one minor error and they were going to just destroy them and turn them into rags. Oh, wow. And it just like blew my mind. Yeah. Wow. Um, and I just started thinking like, 
what? Like these shirts were just shipped from California to Pennsylvania. And now I'm going to ship them back to California so they can literally shred them up and turn them into rags. Oh, and wow. it, just, <laughs> it just blew my mind thinking mm-hmm. about all the oil, all the water, all the shipping, the time that like, you know, I, I grew up very into jigsaw puzzles. Yeah. So this was like a mental jigsaw puzzle. It was like this whole mess of pieces. And it's like, how do I figure out a solution to this? So if you can hear some crazy noises in the back, side note, <laughs> that's deep. Like, like I said, he's, oh, he's currently building a, um, um, I don't know what. There's always something. <laughs> I apologize. Derek no Dickerson. <laughs> um, if anybody knows tiny houses, they surely yeah, know. Everything. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so anyhow, I ended up talking to the merchandise company, talked to the band that I was working for and talked to my mom who sews. And what I ended up doing is getting all those shirts and putting patches for my brand over the original designs and then just selling them as stay vocal shirts. Wow. And everybody won out. And yeah. that was like, a pivotal moment in my brand because then I just not only started seeing solutions everywhere, but started seeing waste everywhere, you know, from how I shop to how I eat to how I dress. Mm -hmm. And that, that just led me down a very passionate reuse life. And 2008 is kind of like the, the pivotal year, I would say both with my brand and my personal life when I made all kinds of changes. So so walk me through some of the changes that you've made. So here's a funny story. You, you're, As I'm, you're filling your coffee cup. So. <laughs> yeah, I'm filling my coffee cup with my, my French press here. Yeah. <laughs> um, so one of, the, one of the big changes, um, I used to be a huge fan of Dunkin' Donuts coffee. In yeah. fact, I won an award. I was customer of the month in 2006 <laughs> for their yeah. newsletter. Yeah. Because I wrote this very excited, passionate thing about how much I love traveling and finding a Dunkin' Donuts and blah, blah, blah. And so one of the big changes was I committed to not giving Dunkin' Donuts one penny of my money until they got rid of styrofoam as of 2008. Oh, wow. And supposedly... I have not, I have not got in to find out, but supposedly they finally got rid of it this year. So 12 years. Oh, wow. And I've created petitions and campaigns and lots of kids around the country, like elementary school kids in New England have created campaigns because their styrofoam trash is such a hazard. And um, so f- supposedly all stores now do not carry it, uh, carry styrofoam, but over that time, I also realized that what they make is not coffee. It's just kind of like brown flavored water. <laughs> you know, I, I moved to Northern California for a while, and that's where I learned what real coffee is. And, you know, I am a bit, a bit of a coffee snob, but hey, that's okay. We all have our thing. Right. <laughs> and so now you're carrying your coffee cup well, you're making your own part of the time. Yeah, so so that's mm-hmm. just one thing. But like, mm-hmm. so since 2008, I haven't used a disposable coffee cup. I haven't that's used amazing. disposable shopping bags. I don't buy paper napkins. I don't buy paper towels. I haven't bought new clothes. Um, but running a brand, I have plenty of access to new to me clothes. Right, right. Um, uh, in 2010, I stopped taking new gifts because for a while I was like, oh, well, somebody else has given it to me. It's okay. But uh, 2010 was that switch. And um, yeah, pretty much any anything that I need or want where there's an easy solution for reuse, then mm-hmm. that's where I go. You know, cool. certain certain things like, you know, if I need to repair my car, you know, I'm going to get like a new piece that keeps that big thing. I'm not going to get a new car. Right. I'm not going to get a new pre-owned car. Right. I'm just going to get a small new. Um, but fortunately, I'm friends with a local garage and they find a lot of used parts for me too. So That's great. Yeah, and we drive vintage vehicles, which means that the car may have oh. been on the road for 50 years. And that's the ultimate green automobile you know yeah if you don't have to build a new one that's the best yep. choice <laughs> yeah it's it's funny i i grew up my dad was a car mechanic and i was never into it but now over time and ha- moving into a vehicle mm-hmm. you know 
and through all of the you know my lifestyle changes i've realized how cool like vintage and antique cars are isn't that neat gas guzzlers but you know well the one on the front yard is a, a 1969 opal record and it gets about 30 miles a gallon what? And I, wait, 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 what is the brand? Opal. Opal? Yeah. What, where, who? <laughs> is that so, made in a different country? Uh, that one was probably made in Europe. Yeah. Opal. Okay. Opal, like the, like the stone. Yeah. Opal, yeah, O-P-A-L, yeah. yeah. And I think they were uh, connected with Buick for a while. I don't know if they okay. still are. So, uh, and we've got a Mercedes from 1984. And Whoa. that's a diesel. It's one of the best engines that's ever built. Very, very um, efficient. Mm-hmm. And my little 79 uh, MGB, that thing gets about 36 miles a gallon. Wow. I mean, that's as good the, what, as a, it's a little roadster, a little convertible. Okay. I need to come visit you guys. <laughs> you and do. And go, go, go get <laughs> coffee and stand right next to you. And like... <laughs> Not this, not this six feet that we have to. Deal yes, with right yeah, now. that that whole coronavirus thing. And six feet is crazy because the, oh, anyway, yeah, because yep. the thing, the the, the ugh. anyway. That's I can spit funny. farther than six feet. <laughs> yeah, really. Um, but but no. Uh, for anybody listening out there, my dream car is an early '80s BMW. You know those small little BMWs. Oh, yeah. And a lot of them are orange. And I really cool. like orange. Yeah. So that's that's my dream car. If anybody out there happens to have one that runs <laughs> and you wanna wanna trade for some t-shirts, I know a guy. Oh, that's cool. And is it a diesel? Is um, that theme or a diesel? I think it is, yeah. So you could turn it into, you know, biodiesel. Yeah, would you would you go that route? Do the whole vegetable oil thing? I would I would like to. And it was a it was a um a thought process that Deke and I had for the truck here. Mm-hmm. But we did not raise enough money to do that. And like that whole process is just. Is know, it an expensive, an expensive switch? Process. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. I knew the process because I researched it, I don't know, many years ago and was completely down the rabbit hole about a, an old Mercedes with a vegetable oil, you know, hit up all the local fry shops and <laughs> yeah. do that thing. But it's a, it's a bit of a, a deal to transition the engine over and to find the oil and to filter it in the whole um, the whole nine yards. So, well, do you, you've seen my film, right? I have. And the yeah, taxis. So, yeah. So the taxi, the taxi fleet in Boise, Idaho, they teamed up with the local French fry um, store. I love that story. Whatever. I love and that story. had a whole fleet of taxis that were biodiesel. It was awesome. Yeah. So. That is really cool. Speaking of the film, um, I, I watched it recently and what I really loved about it was just example after example after example of people being creative about ways to find a second, third, fourth life for things that already exist. Yeah. And it was so inspiring. Tell me about the process of making that film. Um. So that's, that's a question that I, I tend to get um, is, you know, how did I find all these places? Um, so, for example, the, the California place, the skateboarding place, like I had heard about that and that was number one on my list. Being mm-hmm. a skateboarder for now 30 years, like I had to find some kind of cool, you know, skateboard involved reuse. And then... Um, I put up a thing on my website, like an application. So a lot Mm -hmm. of people, you know, applied to be the feature for those, uh, for that certain state. Some of the places I had just heard about, um, but I also graduated with a journalism degree. So I kind of wanted to go out there and like find the story, if you will. Oh, cool. Yeah. Um, My videographer wasn't always so excited because it was pretty stressful. Uh, the, The example that I always give is in Phoenix, Arizona we were on a big time crunch because we had an event planned in San Diego. So we literally had nine hours to do the whole thing in Phoenix, Arizona. So we just hunkered down at this coffee shop and I'll always remember it because the, the barista had this really cool vintage Tony Hawk skateboard t-shirt and that it just made the experience very memorable. But anyway, So we hunkered down, just did a bunch of research, and sure enough, we found, you know, in Phoenix, some guy makes 
um, bow ties. He cuts the pattern of the bow ties out of old, um, out of fashion neckties from the 70s. And it all started because he wanted to keep his grandfather's story alive. So his grandfather passed oh, wow. away and he had all these neckties, but he didn't want to wear them. And he's like, how can I turn this into something that I would wear? And so there it began. Wow, yeah. cool. Yes. So vintage fabric neckties. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, there's, there's just, um, since some places, 48 states and, you know, made a one hour movie about it, not everybody has like a big part unfortunately but there's mm -hmm. a small little clip of me having him show me how to put the bow tie on at the end of the film there oh cool yeah well xavier's a bow tie guy so he <laughs> one time we were at a restaurant and he was he was talking about how you tie it and he untied it and then was putting it back together without looking in the mirror or anything and oh. then he <laughs> looked up and there were like four people watching like whoa that's cool <laughs> Yeah, And it's just, you know, it's so routine for him that he had just done it without looking in the mirror or anything. And of course it turned out great. <laughs> right. So there are bow tie people. And I think we shop a, at a lot of thrift stores and you don't find bow ties at thrift stores. So most no. of the time, the only new item that he's wearing is a bow tie that he's had for, oh, you know, okay. five years. It's just kind of funny because it's not hard to find a blazer or dress pants or um, a vest or whatever to really dress up on thrift store clothes, but then the tie. <laughs> yeah. Um, there's a, there's another uh, woman, the woman in my film from Fargo, North Dakota. So the, the bow tie company, unfortunately in Phoenix is no longer, he went on to do something else, but the woman in Fargo, North Dakota also makes bow ties out of, uh, she keeps, she takes a shirt and then makes a whole bunch of different items like bow ties. I remember her. Shirts. Yeah. So that could be something that you guys could look into if you have, you know, an old shirt that you want to just convert into various things. That is such a great idea. Yeah. A little home cottage industry. Yeah. Really cool. So tell me what you look for in a shirt when you are ready to give it a new life. Oh, that's, that's an interesting process. Obviously, I the easiest thing is a blank shirt. So, sure. and, and it's amazing how many blank shirts that I find at thrift stores. I don't know if people just like outgrow it or they don't like the color or, you know, somebody passes away and it's all their excess. Like it's, but I, I'm able to find <laughs> so many blank shirts. Um, and then I do a lot of inside out shirts mm -hmm. for my brand. Um, which is a really great conversation starter. So I like to call it a second canvas. So you flip a shirt inside out and then the back will have the hang tag and people think like, hey, your shirt's inside out, but wait, why is that? And then it just gets the whole conversation about reuse. One of yours is that way, yeah? Yeah. Well, I don't, this one's not inside out because okay. the tag is on that side, but it does no. have the, um, the stay vocal thing. And so what you're saying is it'll yes. have the tag here and then this explains yep. why it's right side out. Let me read Is the this. other one inside out? Is the other one you have? I want to say. No, they're both, they're both, um, this tag's on the inside. Oh, okay. I'm trying to remember yeah. which one you, okay. Yeah. So um, I have a, a reuse one. Right. Well, so the. Me, uh, the black one, there was there was an embroidered design on there, but then we just printed right over it because mm -hmm. it, it gets hidden under the design. Yeah. So that's something I look for. It's like, um, you know, if I can just hide the design that's on there. Mm -hmm. um, and then if it's going to be inside out, I don't want there to be, um, I don't want it to be too thick of a print because that could be uncomfortable for the person wearing. Okay. Um, it says this garment has been rescued and reused to live again. By wearing it, you are reducing the millions of pounds of discarded textiles that end up in landfills each year, saving energy materials and inspiring new ideas for change. Tell me about the water. Because you quote a statistic that blows my mind. Yeah, and that's, that's actually the shirt I'm wearing <laughs> right now. Can you see it? save uh, uh 713 gallons of water i saved 713 gallons of water by remaking this t-shirt right 
Yeah. 713 so, gallons. Yeah. So that's insane. Beef, yeah. Yeah. The, the number that I used to use all, uh, a lot was um, they did a study years ago and it's it, um, just to trace how much it how many gallons of water were used to grow the cotton and that was 400 and that was a nice round number wow but then national geographic did a study of the entire process of t-shirts so the growing of the cotton the manufacturing everything um and yeah so 713 gallons which is Crazy. when you break it down like you know the old adage like we should all be drinking eight eight ounce glasses of water a day yeah. so 713 gallons of water is the amount that about three and a half people could have for an entire year. That's so, amazing. Do you want to give three and a half people water for an entire year or make another t-shirt? That's easy. That's an easy choice. <laughs> like it's really, you know, yeah. and, and it really started blowing my mind when I lived in Northern California and like, I would literally walk around parks where the earth was like so drought ridden. Mm -hmm. You know, and it just in sure. California is where a lot of cotton is grown. Like, hello? Like, I, it just, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's just, it just blows my mind. Like, and there's, it's amazing. there is no shortage of t-shirts out there. You know, I, I recently acquired, it was like, it was like the gold mine for what I do. So it was a woman who had been running a t-shirt company that was going out of business and she had bought a company that went out of business years ago. And so she had all this back stock in her oh, wow. ba barn in Southeastern Massachusetts. It was like the American pickers for t-shirts. So I like opened up this tarp and it was just bins and bins of blank brand new shirts. And some of them were so old that they were just like vintage USA made fruit of the loom shirts that oh, wow. are valuable in, in and of themselves. You know, they don't need to be printed. T-shirts are valuable in and of themselves. Yeah. There's certain brands, um, certain brands from like the eighties and nineties that you can just sell blank and, you know, they make t-shirts differently. People like USA made stuff. Um, sizing is different. Um, but also a lot of people get them for props, whether it's the TV or movie industry. Oh, also, you okay. Know, gotcha. Because they okay. want to be on point with, you know, Details. So say, say somebody's making that, that 70s show or something, you know, back in the day, they're going to go on eBay and like find vintage stuff. So I had no idea. <laughs> yeah. I, I know a lot more about t-shirts than I ever thought I would. <laughs> But that's, um, that must be amazing to just see a whole stack. I mean, that kind of blows me away to see a whole pile of, of clothes that there was no use for. I mean. Yeah. So the, that same merchandise company that I talked about earlier, I went to visit them in uh, 2008 or nine and I was walking around their facility and right by the loading dock, there was this mountain of boxes and i was like what is all that stuff and it was the exact same answer it was all brand new items that were going to be destroyed because either wow. the bands broke up or they changed merchandise company or they sat too long or whatever it was thirteen thousand pieces hooded sweatshirts <laughs> jackets bags like messenger bags uh t-shirts all this amazing stuff and then to to boot most of that stuff was individually wrapped in oh my goodness bags. oh and my I goodness i was just like are you serious so i i am not a very wealthy man and i definitely wasn't at that point so i did what i could i ended up buying 3000 of them still have some of them because they some shirts are harder to repurpose whether you know from the design on there but it was just blowing my mind i i can't say who it was but i was looking at some of the bands that were there i'm like how did they not sell these shirts like this is a huge rock band yeah you know oh it's it's crazy frustrating yeah so are there some sizes that you can't keep in stock and some sizes that just sit there i mean yeah i uh the majority of my customers are female so mm -hmm. a lot of the typically women's medium and women's large shirts you know sure and 
the very, very frustrating thing, both as, you know, a, a business person, but also to any female that goes shopping at thrift stores, women's shirts are always more expensive than men's t-shirts. Yeah. It's absolutely insane. It is. It, it makes no, it's, <laughs> they get them for the exact same amount, nothing. And then they just end up charging way more. And with the whole, you know, gender pay gap in this country, it just doesn't make any sense. You're right. It doesn't. No. I completely concur. <laughs> wow. So um, help our listeners who are new to this idea. Um, how can they... Um, how can they save water by finding clothes? I mean, what are, what are some recommendations? Obviously go to stayvocal.com and buy a t-shirt. That's a really great place uh, to start. Obviously. Or, or two. <laughs> or, I mean, you know, a dozen. Because they're all shirts that are already here. So. Yes. Yeah. What are <laughs> yeah, some I'm other, actually... oh, other sorry. what are some other suggestions on places where you can find good quality used clothes that aren't necessarily t-shirts, but uh, some other things? Well, so what I tell everybody, whether it's clothing or a French press or a phone or whatever, it's like, check, check eBay, check Amazon, check Craigslist, check Facebook Marketplace. Whatever you need, most assuredly, you're going to find. Maybe it's going to take a little longer. Maybe you're not going to have that video game immediately the day it comes out. But it's amazing. Like, Anything you want is out there. So, so when we were building this here truck, um, there were very few things that I like really specifically wanted. It was more of a find. So when it came time for the electric tea kettle, I did my research and, <clears throat> you know, I found the specific brand that I wanted. And Deke and I both really like orange, hence why I want an orange BMW. Um, <laughs> so I was able to find the exact tea kettle in orange pre-owned online you know it, it took me a little bit longer but like it's all out there you know and then if you favorite pair of jeans it's like a favorite style and size so i will just keep an keep an eye out on ebay and sure enough you know like once or twice a month you know new ones appear um same same with skateboard shoes i have a favorite brand they're unfortunately non-existent they're called ipath most of them were canvas um, and a lot of, a lot of shoes were hemp. They were ahead of the hemp game and they haven't been around in, I mean, it's been at least five years, but I have been able to find so many pairs in my specific size yeah. on eBay used. Oh, know, that's fantastic. At a, at a decent price. Like it's all out there. You just need a little patience. Okay. And a little patience will save you a little money. So it's, it's. Yeah, absolutely. I discovered threadup.com. It's like a thrift store online. Right. And I have been really pretty impressed with buying there. Um, I haven't been very successful with selling clothes there. Um, you know, if it's a $20 item, I may actually only get 75 cents or $2, somewhere in that range. So it's a very small uh, return on your investment if you're going to try to sell something through that. Wait but, a minute, what? <laughs> yeah, what are you it's a, selling stuff for seventy five cents. <laughs> yeah, it's it's completely you know it makes no sense. So I determined that for me, I'll be happy to donate something. But in terms of um, trying to use them to make some money off of clothes, it's not not really going to work for me. Um, yeah. But you know, we've got a dozen places around here to donate clothing and. I don't buy expensive clothing to start with. So it's, it's, I'm not going to be able to turn it around for a couple hundred bucks. So, right. but it's an interesting, um, that, that was my first foray into online used clothing, which I thought was pretty interesting. So okay. I ended up with a cashmere sweater that I have worn all winter long and absolutely love. So that's kind of cool. The other one I, uh, all the kids are doing it is uh, Poshmark. Okay. Right? Yeah. I, I believe that's what it's called. Yeah. So. Yeah. So those are options for people. Yeah. There's, there's plenty of options. And I mean, there's been so many reports out in the past, you know, six months per se, just how so many younger kids are, you know, looking, you know, to, towards thrift stores and used clothes because, 
a lot of kids want to dress like it's the 90s, first of all, um, but also, <clears throat> also they realize that there is a problem and, you know, the amount yeah. of fast fashion documentaries. Or yeah, that's crazy. There, so. Yeah. Talk a little bit about fast fashion. What do you see? What, what happened there? How did we get oh, to? It's, <laughs> I mean, I see it all the time. And, and those are some of the shirts that I will not buy because the shirts that they make now and going back to what i was talking about why shirts from the 90s can sell just as is is the quality of shirts you can see it like if you put together like 80s 90s 2000s 2010s shirts by the same brand you will see the quality just has gone down because they're just trying to churn out as much as they can and you know when you have all of these online you know make your own t-shirts for anything like you know, Cafe Press and Zazzle and whoever, you know, all, you can make t-shirts for anything. Mm -hmm. They just, they're just trying to make as many blank t-shirts. So how do you get t-shirts out and sell more? You just lessen the quality, thinner cotton, less stitching, you know, and it's, it's, and then um, the, the documentary, what is it? Uh, the True Cost. That was a, a great one. Oh, I don't wow. know if you've seen that one. I haven't. So, and, on Netflix, if you're a Netflix person, um, but that did a really good study about fast fashion and then all the chemical dyeing and everything like oh, that. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, speaking of dyeing, I don't know if this is kind of the same process as what you're talking about or not, but in our house, when we have a, a white t-shirt, um, I will buy um, like 10 t-shirts at once. And then Xavier will wear them for a couple of years and then they're not white anymore. And then I dye them in a bunch of different colors and then that gives them a whole new life. Yeah. So then, um, then he wears them until they no longer look acceptable <laughs> to leave the house in and then they may go in the bin. But um, how do you feel about the whole idea of trying to lengthen the life of a shirt by changing the color? Oh, I think it's great. I, I actually have a box marked to be tie dyed. In, oh, fine. In that, yeah. Yeah. In that basement. Um, yeah. Cause a lot of shirts that I get, you know, they'll have like a small stain or pit right. stains, yellowing, you know, just yep. like you said, white t-shirts change color, no matter how much, you know, right. chemicals you want to use. But then comes the second battle that I'm fighting. It's like, I don't want to use all these, you know, chemicals per se. And cause a lot of the tie dyeing, I don't know what you personally use for, for yours, but I've looked into it and a lot of it is just like, not necessarily things that I want to put down the drain. Mm, gotcha. um, I did event shirts for a big eco fest in Los Angeles about 10 years ago. And I made about 80 shirts for the volunteers for the event and I ended up tie dyeing them with grape juice, beet juice, coffee grinds and I think that was it. Now Oh fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, they're not as bright and bold right. as traditional tie dyed. Um and they don't last like forever, right. but it definitely gives it a unique style and look for sure. Um and then there's also lots of other you know, traditional ways, you, Southwest style of dirt, you know, uh, the oranges and browns that you mm -hmm. can get. Um, <clears throat> Indigo. Trying to think. Yeah. But co the coffee grind one is definitely something that I want to get more into. I've, I've experimented with that because I have a lot of coffee grind. Because you, you're you know, a coffee but, person. <laughs> yeah. I'm wondering what it would be like to like stick a bunch of t-shirts in a compost bin. And like, see what see what kind of colors would would run out on that. Oh my goodness! Yeah, the avocado pit would turn things pink, and the what would the banana peel do? And the yeah, <laughs> yeah. maybe I'll try that. Well, there are people who are doing um, maybe not literally a compost bin, but leaf printing and and some oh! cloth. That's cool, isn't oh, it? Oh my gosh! Have you seen it's... some of that stuff? Oh, I just met a woman when I was down in. Fairhope, Alabama, who makes this amazing, I, I, I'm not going to do it justice by trying to explain it, but um, uh, her name is Loretta and she makes these huge tapestries with leaves and dirt. It, it puts all of my like eco dying to shame. <laughs> but I think that's what she's calling it, eco dying. Okay, that's cool. 
and a little yeah. bit of rust. You can really make some interesting orangey colors with rust. It's true. It's yeah. true. I should actually, my dad has a lot of rust, both on his body and in his house. <laughs> so I should go around you the have house. good sources. <laughs> I do. Well, he was a car mechanic, and let's just say that he confuses the term collecting and hoarding. Ah, uh, gotcha. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks for joining me today for the podcast, Alex. Alex is yes, a reuse expert filmmaker and an apparel brand owner. Check him out at stayvocal.com and also check out that documentary at reusedocumentary.com. Thanks for being here, Alex. It's been a blast. Thanks so much. Cheers. You can follow me on Instagram at Carmen Rose Shank. You can subscribe to my channel on YouTube. Please do. And you can download us on iTunes. The music is composed by William Kirkpatrick, lyrics by Louise Estead, arranged and performed by classical guitarist Jonathan Crispin. Show notes available at carmenshank.com.